You're listening to Beyond the Restaurant Podcast, where you'll hear strategies from successful restaurant owners and experts to help you create a thriving business. Here's your host, Andrew Carlson. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Beyond the Restaurant Podcast, and boy, do I have quite the treat for you. I'm so excited to have this next guest on the show. Chef Philip Franklin Lee has stepped into the culinary world as a young dishwasher. From there, he moved through the ranks of the top L.A. kitchens helmed by Quinn Hatfield and Stefan Richter, as well as had stints in Chicago at the acclaimed Alinea and L20. Through his background, Lee unearthed a style of his own with his wife and pastry chef Margarita Callis Lee, opening his scratch-cooking mecca Scratch Bar in Beverly Hills in 2013. In 2015, he moved Scratch Bar from Beverly Hills to Encino, bringing his heart back to his home in the Valley. One of the things that I absolutely love about Chef Philip is that he invests back into his community. Over the last few years, Lee and his Scratch Restaurants group have invested into his hometown of Encino with multiple world-class culinary concepts for the neighborhood. Not only has he done all of this... But he also has many accolades, including San Pellegrino's Young Chef 2015 finalist, Zagat's 30 Under 30, as well as snagged a coveted spot on Jonathan Gold's 101 Best Restaurants list. Lastly, he holds a Food Network record for the most consecutive wins on beating out the competition on Chopped, Guy's Grocery Games, and Cutthroat Kitchen while having previously competed on Bravo's Top Chef in 2013. In the spring of 2018, Scratch Restaurants Group will bring Franklin's Crab and Company, Margarita's Homemade Ice Cream, and two additional concepts to the iconic Montecito Inn. Chef, thank you so much for joining me on the show, and I'm very excited to chat with you today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So for the people in the audience that may not know your story or who you are and just see you as this incredibly successful chef, uh, can you give us a quick rundown of why you got started in the restaurant industry and how you were able to quickly move through the ranks? Uh, sure. Um, I got started, uh, I had a job dishwashing. Um, I dropped out of high school when I was 16 uh, to live on the road uh, playing music. I'm a drummer. Mm-hmm. And uh, in between tours, um, I didn't want to work at Jamba Juice or Starbucks like everybody else. So uh, I was really interested in food. So I tried to get a job cooking. Uh, and cause I had no experience, they said no, but they said you can wash dishes. And as you, uh, finish washing the dishes quickly, um, whenever the dish pit is clean, you can come over here and we'll teach you how to do some stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, I was very, uh, enthralled with that. And so I washed dishes faster than anybody else. So I could get online, you know, start prepping and working with them. And I'd go on tour, come back, become a prep cook, go on tour, come back, become a line cook, go on tour, you know. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, uh, probably about three or four years into that, I stopped. um, stopped. I quit music altogether and and decided this is what I was going to pursue full time. Uh, And in doing so, um, you know, I I worked my way up to become a sous chef, to become uh, an executive sous chef, to become a chef de cuisine, to become an executive chef. Uh, And then in 2013... um, open scratch bar uh and since then i'm now standing in the monarch which opens in july of this year uh which will be our sixth uh restaurant that will be currently open that's amazing (laughs) i mean especially for somebody that started off so young and worked your way through the restaurant that's kind of one of the coolest things about the restaurant industry is that you can have other side projects like you are a drummer and do all of these things and come back and still jump back in like you've never left before um, but having said all of this, what are one of like the key overall, what's that key overall success trait, success trait that you've had that helped you progress through everything? Like, what was that one thing that was like, this is what I'm going to do? Perseverance. Mm-hmm. Uh, really? I mean, that's what it comes down to. I, I, you know, myself, and I think I can speak for a lot of chefs out there. Um, resumes really don't matter, mm-hmm. uh, as much as attitude does. Um, we can teach you how to cook. We can't teach you how to be a good person. Mm -hmm. We can't teach you how to be on time. We can't teach you how to be clean. Those are things your parents should have taught you a long time ago. Um, you know, we can help mold you once you have those basic core fundamental, you know, strengths and what separates, you know, the boys from the men, so to speak, is, uh, that, that longing for, and that, that need to be the best. Mm -hmm. Um, and in this industry, it is quite cutthroat. Um, you know, everyone's vying for the top and the people who get there, it's, it's quite obvious. You know, if I have a, 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 you know, a fresh staff of 10 that's starting like with this restaurant, 
by day two, I'm going to know who's going to be, you know, the next sous chef. It's, it, it's quite obvious of who's showing up early, who's staying late, who's asking questions, who's asking to go home early. Um, and really, I think, you know, for me, I was I was very driven. I thought that, you know, anybody can, you know, be a chef in their, their mid-30s. I said, I want to be a chef, you know, in my mid-20s. Mm -hmm. um, and so I made sure that, you know, as I was coming up, I was working two full-time jobs uh, a, a, a week. The idea was in my brain, if I work two 45 hour jobs a week, well, then I'll get two years experience for every year that that goes by. Um, so five years from now, I'll, I'll have been cooking for 10 years. Um, that was sort of my my idea. Um, and so I, I, I took that, you know, even when I was in culinary school, before I dropped out of that, I was in culinary school in the morning. I was at, uh, you know, working the line at night. And then on the two days off that I had from both of those, uh, I was staging at a Michelin star restaurant, you know sun up to sundown well sun up to sun up almost <laughs> um you know and that was my seven days a week i you know for the first well i still don't have weekends so i'd say for the first 12 years of my career uh you know it's been seven days a week every week no matter what mm -hmm. awesome that's i mean that's crazy because a lot of people are thinking well i need to go to culinary school and then i need to find a job and then that job no, i need to sit there <laughs> I tell everyone who comes to me who's in it to drop out, mm -hmm. unless you're really close to finishing. Um, it, it's if you go to culinary school, you're going to get out and you're going to start at minimum wage, mm -hmm. and you're going to end up leaving the industry in a few years because you're going to realize that at minimum wage you're never going to be able to pay back your bills, um, or you're not going to pay back your bills. You're going to stay in the industry and then you're going to have bad credit and you're going to have be stressed out. Don't go to school. Uh, go get a job. Mm -hmm. Restaurants are looking for chefs. They're, they're looking for cooks. They're looking for people to mold. They're looking for people with no experience but have a passion for food and, and a good work ethic. I, I would much rather take someone who's never worked in the kitchen who has a good work ethic than, than someone who went to school. Mm. Excellent. And so you've worked through – let's <clears throat> just pedal, backpedal a little bit. You've gone through the ranks of some world-class culinary concepts and kitchens and people – things that people would die for to get into. Um, did you take away any of those lessons that you learned there that helped you with the success that you have today? Yeah, I, I mean, when people ask me, wow, they say, you know, the food, food tastes really good. Where'd you go to school? I said, I, you know, I did go to school, but I don't want to credit school at all for um, for this. You know, I, I made it a, a, a point to try to work in the, in the best kitchens that would have me. Um, you know, and I, I, I tried to chase as many Michelin stars as I could. Mm -hmm. Um, and today, you know, Michelin stars is something that I, you know, strive for. And that's, that's something that motivates me, even though we don't have it in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Um, it's still something that I, uh, am motivated by. Um, and, you know, working for some amazing chefs, you know, all over the country, um, you know, really my idea was, you know, the first chef I ever worked for said, don't ever stay anywhere more than a year. Um, cause if you have, if you haven't learned it in a year, you're not going to learn it, go somewhere else, go somewhere completely different. So, you know, six or seven years into my, my career, as I was starting to be, you know, looking for, you know, chef de cuisine positions, um, uh, an executive sous chef positions, I was starting to get people who said, well, your resume, it looks like you jump around a lot. You know, you need to start, you need to spend a few years somewhere. And I said, well, I appreciate that, but that's not my goal. My goal is to go out, learn as much as I possibly can, take everything that I like and put it in one pocket, take everything I don't like and disagree with, put it in my other pocket so I remember what not to do. Uh, and then I'm going to hire myself because I'm going to own my own restaurant. Um, it's from, from day one, my goal has been to open my own restaurant and own my own restaurant. I didn't want to work for anybody. So it was about, for me, going out and learning as much as I possibly could. Go over here and do Spanish food. Go over here and do fine dining food. Go over here and do breakfast. You got to learn how to cook eggs. You got to learn how to make pancakes. You got to learn how to make ice cream. You got to learn how to do everything. And so mm -hmm. for me, it was about learning culinary knowledge. Mm. So how does one go from a chef and then jump into owning your own restaurant? Like, what was the process like for you? Well, uh, <laughs> the process was, um, you know, I actually found uh, a guy who had a coffee shop that uh, closed it at 4 o'clock every day. And I said, look, um, he, he had a kitchen and he did breakfast and lunch there. And I said, look, uh, actually, he approached me. He wanted me to do to run his breakfast, lunch, re revamp his menu. And I said, look, I'll do it and I'll do it for free. But I'd like to starting at five o'clock every day, turn your closed place into 
Scratch Bar. So that's how Scratch Bar was born. We were we basically my team and I ran, you know, the breakfast lunch restaurant and mm-hmm. then from four to five we flipped the restaurant into a fine dining tasting menu on, only place. Um, and we did that for a few months before uh, the owner and I had a falling out. We moved it to my my apartment. My wife and I had it in our apartment, and we uh, fed about 35 guests a night in our one-bedroom apartment in Hollywood uh, for several weeks. And during that time, uh, somebody who ate with us uh, came to me and said, look, I have a restaurant space in Beverly Hills that doesn't have a restaurant inside of it. It's closed. Um, why don't we partner? So we became 50-50 partners, and two weeks later, Scratch Bar was on Restaurant Row, right next door to Matsuhisa, Lowry's, you know, I grew up in LA and restaurant row for me, that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so very nostalgic. And so that's, that's how scratch bar was born. And all of a sudden now I'm, now I'm an owner. That's the, quite the story. <laughs> how did you transform a coffee shop into a fine dining space? Perseverance. <laughs> I, I knew that I wanted to do it and I was not going to take no for an answer. And, you know, I, I, you know, my parents, raised me to believe that if you set your mind to it and you work really, really hard and you understand that nobody owes you anything, uh, but you deserve everything, mm-hmm. uh, and you just work really, really hard and you don't take no for an answer and you figure it out, you can do anything you want. Wow. That's awesome. But so, you have to remember that no one owes you anything and that everybody's <laughs> not going to help you. <laughs> you got to fucking figure it out. Yeah. That's the only downside. <laughs> so the question that I have for you, which is a question on a lot of restaurant owners' minds, is the rising cost of minimum wage, especially in like Los Angeles and California with the always ever increasing, you know, operating costs. What have you done to help compensate that while keeping your staff happy? Well, we tried to really get ahead of it. Um, We started, I want to say in 2013, um, implementing a service charge. Um, uh, Well, that's not true. In 2013, we actually started doing a pooled house. So mm-hmm. I, I got rid of the idea of, of bussers and, and runners and started having the cooks run the food uh, and then man- then mandating a pooled house so that uh, servers and cooks split the tips. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was one of the ways that, that I did it. Uh, I also dabble with the, with the service charge, which we do now at, at Scratch Bar. Um, but the idea has been, you know, to make sure that everybody's paid accordingly. And unfortunately it is what it is. The cost of living is going up. You know, I, I did go and I, I personally spoke, um, at the city council meeting, um, not in opposition of the raise of minimum wage, but in opposition of the, uh, the non tip allocation. Um, and, uh, the idea that, you know, if, if servers are making 60, 70 grand a year, um, sorry, I told you I'm in a construction. All good. Room. All good. Uh, if servers are making 60, 70 grand a year in tips alone, do they really need to go from, you know, 10 to $15 an hour um, when the cooks are just making 10? Like, it, it's not about minimum wage. It's about why did, if you're making 60K, 70K, 80K a year, why do you need another $3 an hour when I could, I'd rather give that $3 an hour to a cook? Mm. Um, I also went ahead and when we opened Scratch Bar, uh, we didn't have any servers when we relocated to Encino in 2015. Uh, we opened the restaurant only with chefs, um, and doing so, they share 100 percent of the tips, uh, and I'm able to compensate all of them accordingly. Wow. And do you think that concept could be used in different concepts, or more just the fine dining? Or you're seeing this more in a lot of chefs opening quick service restaurants. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sort of like the in and out model where you've got, you know, a a small handful of cooks who double as cashiers, who double as dishwashers, who double as, you know, um, and it's because we just can't afford it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I had to, you know, raise the price of scratch bar quite a bit. Dinner there is not, not inexpensive. It has a lot of value and it's less expensive than it's, you know, uh, other fine dining 20 plus course tasting menu competition, Mm -hmm. about half the price of those, um, But, you know, that's because I also don't have a captain with four runners and bussers and all. You know, I stripped away sort of what I felt was a little bit unnecessary Mm -hmm. uh, because to me, you go to – there's two different reasons you go to a fine dining restaurant um, and really depends on who you are. Some people go just for the food. 
Some people go for the service. Some people go for the combination of both. And I thought, why can't you get amazing service with cooks? I mean, I, I, I like to give service. You know, it, it, mm-hmm. we're in the hospitality business. And I also thought cooks should start to learn the idea of hospitality. Mm-hmm. So many cooks are hardwired to believe that fuck the customers, fuck the servers, mm-hmm. I'm making food. No, that's not correct. Um, without the customers, you ha- you can't make food. You know, you don't like. I tell the, you guys don't work for me. You work for the guests out there. Mm-hmm. I don't pay you. I collect their money, and I divvy it out. That's all I do. Mm-hmm. So um, it's really important as a cook to understand that you do not work for your chef. You work for the guest. Mm-hmm. The reason you still work for your chef is because the guest is having a good time. As soon as the guest is not happy, you don't work for the chef anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's that understanding that, like, stripping that away to say, look, let's focus on where the money really needs to go and how to get it so that we don't have to shut down the restaurant. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And what, with that being said, do you think that because of your methodology of doing things, stripping away what's not necessary, do you think that's helped contribute to the success and has made it? You've raised the bar in LA for your restaurants. I hope so. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. To be honest, I don't really pay too much attention. Um, we're about to open our third restaurant so far in 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, next month, we've opened two already so far, and we're only in June. Uh, so I, 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 I'm just pushing forward and not taking no for an answer. And to be honest, I don't really, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> not I don't really pay too much attention about whatever. It's working for me, mm-hmm. and we're successful with it, so I'm just, I keep doing it. Okay, so then with all of the openings that you've done, like this is your third opening in 2018, what is your strategy to maintain the standards in your other restaurants while you're away? Uh, we do not teach recipes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we teach approach. We teach philosophy. Um, and that's it. If I teach a cook how to make something, and all he's doing is replicating, one, there's no heart in replication. That's mm-hmm. what robots are for. There's heart in creation. Uh, and if I teach a cook how to create and the fundamentals and philosophy behind why we create, how we create, and what we're looking for when we create, then if I'm not there, he'll be exci- he or she will be excited to create. If I'm not there and all of a sudden we have, let's say for example we have a watermelon whatever, mm-hmm. right? Watermelon has a different flavor every single time you open a watermelon. So a lot of restaurants they tell you 32 grams of watermelon and then 30, you know, however many grams of, of salt or sugar or whatever bullshit. Mm-hmm. Well, what about when the watermelon's sweeter or not as sweet or too sweet or too sour or not ripe, right? So you're going to have guys making stuff that's going to be all over the place. Instead, we have a saying in our company about consistency. I don't want it to be consistently the same. I want it to be consistently fucking delicious mm-hmm. and the best you can make. That's it. As long as you consistently make it the best. Today was better than yesterday and tomorrow is better than today. We're good. But if it tastes just like yesterday, that gets kind of boring. Sure. The, amazing. And have you ever had to close any concepts? Uh, I, well, yes, uh, we did close scratch bar, uh, mm-hmm. when I had a falling out with that partner I spoke about who I met at, when we were in the apartment, uh, but we closed it to move it. Okay. Um, and I, I owned the name, which is why we relocated. Mm-hmm. We also had another concept called the gathering swine that was also with that same partner. Unfortunately, because we opened that, that restaurant together, uh, I did not own exclusive rights to the name. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because of the falling out with that partner, uh, I was not able to uh, retain the name, and therefore uh, it did shutter for good. Okay. Um, but we have plans to bring back a vegetable-focused restaurant, which The Gathering Swine was. Excellent. And a lot of restaurant owners struggle with the concept of a partnership. What, like, what are tools to know this partnership's going to work or this partnership's not going to work that, for, that you've seen personally? It has to be about the betterment of the business. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. As a chef, 
you eat, sleep, dream, bleed, sweat, whatever is best for my kitchen. Mm -hmm. As a chef owner, you eat, sleep, breathe, etc. what's best for my restaurant. Sometimes as just an owner, you eat, sleep, breathe, what's best for my bottom line. Mm -hmm. And there can be a lot of headbutting in the difference between I want what's best for the restaurant and you want what's best for the bottom line. There has to be, and here's where a great partnership comes, is when you figure out how to marry those two. Mm. You you worry about what's best for the bottom line. I'll worry about what's best for the restaurant, but let's do it together so we're collaborating so what everything we do benefits both. Mm -hmm. But when you become blindsided to only one, that's when it's very difficult to work with a partner. Okay. You and, have to share. You have to share long-term goals. Mm -hmm. And do you think that starts at pre-conversations before getting into that partnership? Like, what are your what are your philosophies, and what are the other person's philosophies? Absolutely, but as you we've all seen in movies, and as we've all heard, money changes people. For sure. Absolutely. So, um, it, it's sort of like you you don't marry someone until you been with them for a little bit right <laughs> unfortunately it, it's a very very similar scenario when it comes to partners however you can't kind of date as partners for five years before you get married unless you're very lucky for example let's say uh you've been a chef and you've had a your gm and you guys have been working in a restaurant you know take a love madison park for example mm -hmm. you know classic case of 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 chefs and uh, and general manager working together to make the restaurant such an amazing place, then they have the opportunity to buy the restaurant. Of course, the partnership's going to work. It already worked. It was already a partnership. Everything you do in life is, is you know, especially in a restaurant, is a mm -hmm. partnership. Sure. The, the line cooks are the line cooks. The servers with the chefs. The we're, we're all we're all working together as partners. So, you know, it's only when you start introducing lots and lots of money that it starts to get convoluted. Okay. And so. About the competition shows that you've been on, I mean, you hold the rec one of the records for beating out the competition. So what's sure. what was that process of getting on those shows like? Do you think it's worth it to try to get on those shows? Uh, for me, it was totally worth it. I was always the guy who said, I'll never do TV, I'll never do this, you know, screw that. And then I became a chef owner and went, oh, I don't pay myself to work here and I can't afford to pay myself to work here. So I work for free. Uh, and it's hard to live when you work for free sure. for years. So uh, I thought, well, I guess I'll do some of these competition shows. Um, I didn't go out looking for them. In fact, I got a, I got a phone call saying, hey, uh, you're, you've been recommended by about five or six people who won Chopped. Uh, will you be on Chopped? And I said, you guys pay 10000 They said, yes. I said, yeah, sign me up. <laughs> um I won that, and then the very next day, while I was on a, I, I, I was flying back to LA, and the very next day, on the tarmac, I, I turn my phone back on, and it rings. It's like, hi, it's so and so from, from uh, Food Network. We have a new show called Guys Grocery Games. We heard you did well on Chopped. Uh, we shoot tomorrow. Would you like to be on it? I said, sure. What, what can you win? They said, twenty grand. I said, sign me up. I went the next day, and I won that. Um, and then uh, a couple months later, I get a call. Hey, uh, we got a new show called Cutthroat Kitchen, and uh, we heard you've done really well on other shows. You want to be on it? I said, sure. What's it pay? <laughs> uh, sign me up, and I went and won that. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, Guys Grocery Games have, have brought me back on three or four other times um, to compete and also to judge and stuff like that. I, I don't know. You know, uh, I really do credit um, Food Network for helping our restaurant group not just grow but survive because – you know, that that opening year, I was able to make forty grand mm -hmm. on TV, which is like, you know, back then that was like what a sous chef would make. Sure. Uh, so it was, you know, I actually didn't get paid to work at the restaurant, but I was getting paid and working at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was bringing people into our restaurant because of publicity. So it was actually a fantastic thing. Okay. And do you think, since all that publicity was happening, that's what was bringing a lot of intrigue into who you were in your restaurants? I don't think it hurt. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that, you know, definitely we're, we're in L.A., mm -hmm. so it's a little bit less uh, – people get less starstruck here than they do in other parts of the country. Sure. Um, but I definitely think that, you know, when people watch those shows, they go, oh, 
crap, I got it in my backyard. They come and check you out. Um, but, you know, I had been cooking in L.A. for about seven years before Scratch Bar opened. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we were able to, to, you know, we opened with some good press and, you know, there was a little bit of tension on us. Um, not much. We were still very young, had no name. I think I was 25 back then. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it was – it still is. It's fun. <laughs> Excellent. And – I'm curious because one of the we got a question on Instagram. Somebody DM me and wanted to ask you a question, especially in Los Angeles. It's kind of one of those things where you're hot, you're a hot restaurant until you're not, and then there's a new restaurant opening up, and that one's the hot one. So how do you stay, you know, in the know, or how do you stay relevant in this industry? So a lot of my team gets very frustrated because. Um, I work in a very organic ma manner. Mm -hmm. A lot of restaurants say, this is who we are. This is what we do. We do not deviate from this path. Uh, I think the complacency is the, is the recipe for death. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we're who we are, what we do, and the path that we're on is to be the best restaurant at all times. And the best restaurant tomorrow might not be the same as the best restaurant today. Mm -hmm. Same thing with consistency. I don't want to consistency be the same. I want to consistently be the best. So, you know, we're always changing the dishes. We're always changing. I wouldn't say the concept. The concept's always been that we make everything from scratch. We are a tasting menu restaurant. You deal with the chefs. Um, but we're always pushing to be better, pushing to be what's, you know, um, with, with, with a place that's so fluid. I mean, I always make a joke that, like, you know, I could go – like I could I could break this T bar ceiling right now. I have no one to answer to except myself, and I have to go fix fix and pay for the T bar. Sure. You know, so like when I have the idea to paint the walls pink, we paint the fucking walls pink. Mm -hmm. um, I just try to resist those urges sometimes. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, uh, it, it really is about. Sometimes people say, "Okay, I, I, you know, you, you know the expression: if it's not broke, don't fix it." Mm -hmm. Well, you've also heard the expression break it so that you can fix it and make it better. And so I don't really prescribe it either. I prescribe the idea that what, what do you, what do you believe in? Mm -hmm. You know, you're growing as a human being every single day and six weeks from now, you won't be who you are today. And five years you are from now, you won't be who you are today with the new experience, with the new understanding you have of life, of guests, of cuisine, of culture. Um, how do you continuously uh, and seamlessly at least the way it looks, incorporate that into what you have to offer your guests. And I think when you look at, you know, certain companies, you know, that are really doing well out there, when you look at Nike, when you look at, you know, uh, Facebook, when you look at, you know, uh, even Coca-Cola, you, know, you look at these big companies and how, what, what are the ones that are doing well? They're continuously adapting and they're changing and they're growing with the culture that we live in. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ones that truly will stand the test of time are the ones that aren't looking to capitalize on the culture, but they're looking to enhance the culture. Okay. So do I don't you... Know that answer, you know, Absolutely. That was, that was a great answer. And well, do, you, <laughs> do you think that people that decide to go the franchising route, I know that's not your domain, but do you think that causes a lot of the stagnation because there's more, more moving parts and moving pieces? I don't know. Um... I mean, I think that, you know, one of the reasons that we, you know, we have six restaurants today uh, and we're getting, we'll, we'll be at nine by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and no two are identical, but no two are different. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think that it's, I, I personally don't like the idea of taking something and dropping it somewhere else because mm -hmm. I built this for here, you know, and you've got to have, that's what a lot of my issue is with a lot of corporate America and corporate everything is, sure. you know, uh, you know, my, my, my biggest pet peeve, go to mm -hmm. a restaurant, corporate restaurant, and let's say you're, you're having a beer and you go, ah, I have a little more food, I want a little more beer. Can I get a half beer? Oh, we don't do that. You know, it's on draft, right? Yeah. I'm like, well, can't you just draft it half, half the way? No. I'm like, can I pay for a whole one to get half the beer? No. Why? That's our policy. Fuck your policy. The policy is hospitality. Mm -hmm. the, the policy is make the fucking guests happy. 
I hope you can swear on your show. I'm you sorry. can. You can. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, it frustrates me because the policy should be to make people happy. That's the business. We are in hospitality. We're not in the ego-stroking business. Sure. Although a lot of people forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And the question that I have for you is do you look at the trends and do you incorporate the trends into your restaurants? Or do you make your own trends and you're like, this is just what it's going to be? I try – to not look at what's cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, or if I do see what's cool, I try not to do it. Um, okay. It's just a weird thing about me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Especially when it comes to like plating and stuff. You'll see like everybody's covering the entire top with things perfectly like this. All right, guys, we're not covering the top of fucking anything. You know? <laughs> um, because there's no reason to. Everyone else is doing it. Sure. Um, and they're probably going to do it better. So why, again, why would we recreate what they're doing when we can try to create our own thing? Um, and again, you know, I have a restaurant that has a cheeseburger on. I have a restaurant that has a fucking Caesar salad on the menu. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there's a time and a place for those things. Um, and it's about understanding, you know, what is the concept? Mm-hmm. You know, what concept? If you've got a place that's specifically supposed to be a comfort place that serves, you know, things that people are used to, then, then serve things people are used to. Mm-hmm. If you're in a place where you're, you're trying to, to push the envelope and you're trying to make the best thing that you possibly can – then do that. But the best thing you can make is not something that that guy made. It's something that he doesn't know exists because you haven't made it up yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have two more questions for you. The first one is going to be, what is your biggest failure that you've experienced throughout your career? Because you seem like the kind of guy that likes to fail fast. You haven't failed yet. No, because I don't think you, I don't think you fail until it's over and Mm -hmm. you gotta be dead to do that. True. Like you play video, you used to, we play video games, right? Oh, of course. You don't you don't fail till game over. Game over for us is not till you're dead. Mm-hmm. So you, even if you lose, well, you like you learn to say, well, okay, no, so I got to do. All right, I got to turn left a little bit. I got to jump a little faster. Okay, next, then you try it again. Fuck. Okay, I got to jump later. Oh fuck, I got to turn left. That's not failure. That's learning. Mm-hmm. That's life. Okay. You fail when you die and you didn't succeed. I like that. All right, last question. But it's dead, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, true. <laughs> All right. So the last question that I have for you is it's kind of the overarching me- uh, message that I have for the podcast on every episode and I ask every single guest. So do you believe that there is a work life balance and do you think it's possible to achieve a life beyond the restaurant per se? Is it possible? Yes. Um, and it also depends on who you're asking and, and in what context for a young cook. Absolutely. Uh, for it, it, for for an executive chef, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Once you start getting into chef owner, it's very difficult, um, especially with my wife being our pastry chef and co owner. Um, our house, our home, has six desks in it and has a full time staff. Our, our corporate office is in our house. Mm-hmm. Uh, we haven't necessarily designed our lives to have a work life balance, um, but with that being said, the work is my life. I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't go to work. I haven't gone to work in five years. Um, I'm just, I wake up and this is what I do with my day. I don't have days where I go and just sit on the couch and hang with my, my buddies and, you know, and, and I choose not to. I choose mm-hmm. to have my life be about, this is what I do for fun. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember being younger and it's like, oh, let's go, uh, we're, we're going to go and, and sit on this guy's couch and, you know, hang out or we're going to go here and do this and, now it's like, you know, instead of going to my friend's house to hang out all day, I go to the restaurant and I hang out all day. <laughs> you know, that, that's my life. And while I'm there, I get shit done, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so there's only a work-life balance if you, if you recognize them as two separate things. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they, and if, they, if they are not two separate things, then, you, then there is no – how do you balance the same thing? True. All right. Well, Chef, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so honored that you took the time. I know you're insanely busy with the construction and everything. That's right. I mean, look, you can you can see we're we're in the middle. Oh yeah. Of building a restaurant here. Looks good. <laughs> Believe it or not, this place will open in two. Well, how many weeks? Where are we? Five weeks. We'll be open. Five. Okay, I'm gonna come opening day. So what's if people want to know more about you? Where is the like best place on social media that they can find you? They can follow you and learn more about you. Um, I post on Instagram quite a bit as Philip Franklin Lee. Um, 
I mean, come to the restaurants. Mm-hmm. I'm usually, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Come and hang out with me. Have a conversation with me. You'll, you'll be willing to come on out and have conversations with anyone. There is no out. The, all my restaurants have open kitchens. So, Love it. I mean, um, you know, I'm, but now we have, you know, six restaurants, so I'm not in every single one of them every day, but if I'm there, mm-hmm. you know, and you see me say hello, I love it. Sounds good. That's why we built, that's why we built these open kitchens, not mm-hmm. so you can watch us, but because the idea of like, we're spending all day and night in this kitchen, we want to hang out with you. We mm-hmm. want to meet new people. We don't have time to go to the bar before last call and make new friends. So the friends that we make are, are, you know, a lot of my friends now are, are, are regulars and our guests who have become my friends. Amazing. Well, I'll make sure to post all the links, all the addresses to all your restaurants and everything in the show notes. Chef, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was such a pleasure having you. I'll have all the links and everything in the descriptions and show notes below. Do you have anything else that you want to say before you, we end the show? Uh, well, here's something fun. I don't know if we, we didn't talk about this. Uh, if you are a young cook, uh, if you're a cook, you didn't forget age or whatever. If you're a cook, uh, go to our website, scratchbarla.com, click on the link that says back of house exchange program, and you can eat at scratch bar for free. Hey, even better. Do they get to help you cook and everything? Uh, or just eat? I might make you, but no, no, no. <laughs> uh, but if you come, if you go there, click the link, watch the video. It tells you how to eat for at, at, eat a 20 course tasty menu for free at our restaurant. You got to be a cook though. Okay, you heard it. I'll put the, that link in the show notes as well. If you want to eat for free at his restaurant, then you will follow those instructions. And if you're going to visit L.A., make sure that you check out his restaurants. Chef, thank you so much for coming on the show. And have a great rest of your day and enjoy the construction. I look forward to the opening of your new restaurant. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.